welcome to the Fresh Heart Project. We provide evidence-based tools to refocus your energy and optimize your health. My name is Zareen, I'm a cardiologist and your host. Today, we're going to focus on stress. Stress has always been an issue. Before COVID-19 ground the world to a halt, the World Health Organization were calling stress the pandemic of the 21st century. The events of this past year have heightened a lot of our stress levels. We've had to change our lives, not see friends and family. We've had to cope with illness, loss, grief. Parents have been working and homeschooling. It's not been easy. The interesting thing about stress is that as well as affecting your mental health, it can cause physical symptoms. And ultimately, if left unchecked, it can lead to physical illness. I see this day in, day out in my clinical practice. In my outpatient clinics, stress manifests as palpitations or an awareness of your heartbeat, often racing, chest pain, fatigue, or breathlessness. It's really important for me to exclude any significant cardiac issues, so I will always investigate, but more often than not, the investigations are really reassuring. I'll never forget on one occasion when I was on call for the week, I came into the coronary care unit for my weekend ward round. I looked around and the unit was full of young men who had just had heart attacks. On this occasion, they didn't have much in the way of risk factors, but what they all reported was immense levels of stress leading up to their presentations. Stress is associated with high blood pressure, with triggering palpitations. It can harm our gut microbes that are working with us to not only digest food, but to act as part of our immune system. Production of sex hormones is affected as pathways are diverted to supply more cortisol as a reaction to the stress response. Stress is not your fault. It's an evolutionary mechanism designed to protect us. But we're designed for acute doses, not chronic ongoing situations. So what can we do? It was my pleasure to talk to Lucille Allen Paisant. Lucille had her own journey with stress and burnout, and her recovery inspired her to create the Leeds Wellbeing Week, and she also set up and is the director of MindIt, a training company that supports employees to thrive at home and at work. Lucille talks to us about stress, healthy and unhealthy coping mechanisms, and she shares her nine wonderful steps to well-being, which give you actionable tips for coping with the stresses of everyday life. I am uh, Lucille Allen Paisan. I am French. I live in Leeds uh, in the UK. I arrived there in 2016 uh, after almost experiencing burnout. Uh, before that, I was marketing director in a small business in Paris, working six, seven days a week, too much, loving my job, and then realizing that um, it was, uh, yeah, just too much. And now I'm all about making sure that people don't experience burnout themselves uh, by making them aware of the signs of stress in their body uh, and mind. Symptoms of burnout that I experienced uh, back then were, for me, the, the lack of sleep, not being able to fall asleep at night, whether the um, the, the brain doesn't seem to be able to, to stop. Whenever I was uh, doing something to supposedly relax, I would still be on with work um, challenges. I became very cynical about work as well. So even though I loved my job and I was passionate with it uh, for a couple of years, after a little while, I started becoming cynical, I was being negative, um, and then just not the kind of positive person I used to be at work, but also outside of work. With burnout, you often have some work components. So very often when you work too much, where you have a lot of responsibilities, you never switch off. Or quite the opposite, when you're bored and you have a lack of recognition and you feel that you're uh, not useful or you have no impact. But there also, so there's that work uh, aspect, but also the lifestyle aspect and personality. So it's not all about work. It's uh, very often you, you have people who are 
busy at work and have a lot of responsibilities, but they also are busy outside of work with uh, some, I don't know, they might be involved in the club, they might the club of their kids, they might be involved um, in friend groups a lot, they might always organize socials. And the third aspect is personality. Uh, when you want to have control over things, you're not likely to delegate or to ask for help. So you're more likely to experience uh, burnout. So, and I had these three aspects, the work, the um, lifestyle, the busy lifestyle and the personality. Lucille's experience taught her a lot about burnout and also about stress. Stress is a term that we use so often. So what is stress? What happens to us when we're stressed? Lucille goes through these important questions. She discusses the negative, but also the more positive aspects that we don't often think about. We all experience stress. It comes from the evolution of uh, the human species. Whenever there's a danger that we identify, there's a stress response in our bodies. So we can find uh, that we have our heartbeat goes up or we start being sweaty. We have sweaty palms. Uh, we start shaking maybe. However, right now we're not likely to, to face a lion in, in the wilderness um, anymore. So uh, we have the same um, stress responses in our body and in our mind, but we don't have the same triggers. So we, whenever we feel the stress response is that we have identified a danger. So very often when I talk about stress in uh, work and work environments, um, it's important to be aware of the, the, the signs in our mind and our body, but it's most important to be aware of the causes of stress. Is it that big project coming up? Is it um, a difficult conversation that you need to have? Is it because you're gonna do some public speaking the following week? Um, so it's important to understand the reasons uh, of stress as well as being aware of the signs. But stress in general is good. It's positive. If we, if we were not stressed at all, we would just stay in bed. We would just be uh, lying around, not doing anything. We all need a little bit of stress and the stress hormones. It's just a, a matter of identifying the, the positive stress. That is that stress that gets, uh, gets us to go that extra mile, to work a little bit harder. Uh, to make us uh, make ourselves, uh, you know, go um, go further or deeper, and on the opposite, you have the negative stress. That is that stress that is taking over your mind. That is uh, uh, always there. That is constantly there. When you go from adrenaline rush to adrenaline rush, and you actually never uh, rest and digest. Uh, that's, that's the important thing, to make the difference between the two of them. Lucille makes an incredibly important point. Not all stress is bad. Stress motivates you to achieve. So it's important to recognize the difference between that and the stress that is chronic, unrelenting and negative. So how do we recognize when stress isn't helping? To uh, spot the signs of stress, uh, the, the important thing is to try to identify the, the odd things. So if you never, if your belly never aches and it starts aching all of a sudden, uh, if you're uh, always a good sleeper and you start waking up in the middle of the night, then it means that there might be uh, some underlying stress issues. And mostly if you change behavior. So if you start snapping at people, if you start getting impatient, if you start talking uh, in, a, in a very impatient and negative way to, to your loved ones, maybe it means that it's not their fault, but there might be some other uh, realities or some other circumstances impacting you at that time, which are stressful. Uh, my grandmother always says that it's never about washing the dishes. Uh, so if you fight with your partner uh, or, uh, or one of the family members about washing dishes, uh, very often it's not about the dishes, it's about all the other things that have happened throughout the day or throughout the week that actually uh, created uh, that, that situation and just it just bursted in the middle of the kitchen. 
I love that. It's never about washing the dishes. Wise words from Lucille's grandmother. Lucille's experience with stress and burnout inspired her to develop her own organisation to support people going through similar journeys. I started uh, Mind It Limited to uh, make sure that we took the burnout problem and the stress problem in general um, at the root, which is in the workplace. So we organize well-being sessions at work. Uh, we do sessions around stress management, resilience, mindfulness, meditation, um, and also laughter, yoga, mindful walks. So it's quite broad. It's to give everyone an opportunity uh, to experience positive activities uh, um, and taking care of, them, of themselves at work with their colleagues. But also for me, it's an opportunity to raise awareness uh, among managers and leaders um, so that they understand that people who, are, uh, who, are, who feel well, people who look well after themselves um, are more productive, but also um, they can thrive within the workplace and outside of the workplace. And it's all the better for the organization they work for. Stresses come from all corners and it can be hard to know how to cope. Lucille has a useful tool for classifying stress into what we can and can't control. During this next section of the recording, you'll hear Lucille's gorgeous young baby who also wanted to join in with the discussion. One useful tool to think about stress is the circle of concern versus circle of control. It helps us to identify the sources of stress and to classify them because some sources of stress are legitimate. Uh, they're, we, we can be stressed about them and we should be stressed about them, such as a public speaking gig, such as a, a new activity at work or a new role or a promotion. Uh, um, Sometimes just as being on time to record a podcast can be a stressful situation. Uh, some uh, others are um, not legitimate because we have no control over them. The pandemic right now, we have no control over it. So uh, as stressful as it might be, uh, we, tr we need to try our best to let it go and to not get let it um, take up our mind, take up our mental space, take up our energy. So the circle of concern versus circle of control is that um, useful activity to identify the legitimate sources of stress and the, the ones that should not be uh, too much of a concern. So the, whenever there's a stress factor, uh, you can try to wonder, uh, do I have control over it? And if the answer is no, then we need to try to let it go. If the answer is yes, then it means that we can take action and we can take one step towards making it a bit less uh, stressful. I find it so helpful to be able to categorize stress. There's a lot that's beyond our control and recognizing that is the first step. The next step is developing mechanisms to cope. Lucille talks to us about how easy it is for coping mechanisms to become unhealthy. So whenever we identify a source of stress, we all have things that we do in order to feel better. Sometimes uh, we are conscious about them and, and sometimes we're not conscious about them. For example, um, uh, whenever I'm stressed, I would go back and forth between my desk and the chocolate cupboard. Uh, that, and I am conscious about it now, but before I was not really realizing why I was overeating on some days or specifically on Mondays when I was planning my week, for example. We all do things to compensate and to take the stress levels down. Um, uh, some of them are healthy and some of them are unhealthy. The healthy ones help us to overcome stress on the long run. Uh, the unhealthy ones are easy, quick fixes, sometimes very appealing because they're very efficient on the short term. Um, however, they don't work on the long term, such as a whole chocolate bar or uh, two glasses of wine, etc. It doesn't mean that we should never do them. Uh, we can all eat a full bag of crisps and it's fine once in a while. 
However, if they become a daily habit, if we need these uh, two, three, four glasses of wine in the evening in order to uh, take the stress levels down, that's when it can become uh, quite unhealthy. It's so easy for coping mechanisms to become unhealthy. And most importantly, it's totally understandable. We all do it. But how can we develop some healthy coping mechanisms? Lucille shares with us her nine tried and tested steps which can help you manage your stress. These nine steps develop healthy coping mechanisms which allow you to deal with the difficult, unpredictable stresses of daily life. We created uh, the nine ways of well-being or nine ways to cope with stress as suggestions or as inspiration for people who are looking for ideas uh, who don't really know what it is a uh, healthy coping mechanism um, just to start with a healthy coping mechanism is whatever makes you smile or relax or don't see the time pass um, so whenever you find yourself in a situation where you feel relaxed and you feel that like you haven't looked at your phone for the last 45 minutes, this would be a good um, healthy coping mechanism uh, for you. I often say that going for a walk or just uh, sitting on the sofa with a cup of tea can be a very healthy coping mechanism. It doesn't have to be fancy or we don't have to go the extra mile and be Instagram-like people. It can be very simple. So the first way of well-being uh, is to connect. Uh, connecting with people is key to make sure that we uh, have good conversations, that we call our loved ones, especially right now during the pandemic. Uh, we uh, might have experienced um, uh, isolation, feel isolated, feeling lonely. Well, whenever uh, you feel that way, uh, reach out to people. Uh, if you can't meet them in person, uh, uh, talk to them over the phone. You don't have to have a reason to call somebody. Uh, just a good chat and just saying hi and how are you uh, is a good enough reason. And my daughter is yawning now. I hope I'm not too boring. <laughs> so connecting with people, disconnecting from uh, screens in general. Because we are so, uh, we spend so much time on screens, so much time uh, talking to, uh, talking to, to screens actually, or just uh, chatting. If it's not the computer, it's the phone or the tablet. But also as simple as the blue light that we get uh, whenever we are on screen. That is a brain stimulation. So it doesn't, it might prevent us uh, from um, falling asleep or from relaxing in general. And the third way of well-being is breathing. Uh, so breathing means um, uh, take time to stop, taking time to have a break. Uh, don't necessarily force yourself to work uh, 8.30 till 5.30 in front of the screen because that's what you used to do pre-pandemic. Um, Make sure that you take breaks as you would take break with your colleagues at work, for example, uh, with a, a coffee break uh, with your partner if uh, you live with somebody. Uh, but also uh, you can take what I call power moments, uh, which means instead of rushing to the extra task, try to take a, a five minutes and you can even put a timer, five minute timer on your phone to do nothing. Um, so for me, for example, I realized that whenever I was um, I had the opportunity to work, I was putting my little one to nap and then rushing to empty the dishwasher and then uh, trying to work and rush to send emails and answer emails. And I was not really productive by doing that. So what I started doing is whenever I was putting her down for a nap, I would make myself a cup of coffee and drink, drink that cup of coffee before doing anything else. So really take that five minutes. Uh, so one, I get to drink a warm cup of coffee, which is quite nice. And two, I get five minutes to think about the extra, the next task. And then I become more productive and uh, I, I don't rush into things and multitasking. So breathing, um, taking breaks is very important. Uh, the fourth way of well-being is uh, being active. 
uh, moving your body. And I, I, I know there are a lot of um, uh, pressure around uh, being active, around uh, uh, doing sports. And there's so many, uh, I, I felt pressurized during the first lockdown to, you know, keep active and um, doing all these exercises at home that everybody uh, was doing. So uh, what I want to say here is that, yes, it is a very important way of well-being because it releases endorphins in the body and it makes you feel great uh, after a sports session. But what I want to say is uh, do what you love, do what makes you smile. It can just be the easy things, going for 30 minutes walk and uh, dancing for five minutes every day. Uh, really, really does it. So I hate exercising myself, so I'm never going to tell people to <laughs> do it. However, moving your body and being active is a very important way of well-being. The fifth way of well-being is uh, to give. And giving does not necessarily mean uh, giving money. It can just be giving smiles, um, do some random acts of kindness making sure that uh, you give people your attention whenever you ask questions or whenever you have a conversation. Um, when you ask someone, how are you? Really listen and wait for the people to answer to uh, that question so that they, they get the opportunity to tell you really how they are. So this give, giving is more giving care, giving uh, attention, giving time, uh, especially in these, in these uh, times. The sixth way of well-being is learning. Keep learning. Um, so learning new things, how to make sure that uh, we keep our brains stimulated, uh, that we don't remain in our old ways, in our old routines, uh, that we learn new things, not necessarily every day. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean learning a new language either. It can just uh, be little things. Um, uh, drawing with uh, one of your kids uh, can be a way to learn new things. Um, just taking a different path whenever you go for your walk, just uh, discovering a new way can be also a way to discover new things. And just, um, just think about the joy of doing something new. Uh, one exercise that I usually do whenever I run the, uh, uh, the stress awareness workshop is the five fingers gratitude exercise. Uh, so in the evening, maybe trying to name five things that you're grateful for today. And you can go for the big things in life. I'm grateful for uh, friends, for family, for having a house. Uh, but also um, you, you might want to try and go for the little things uh, that happen specifically today. I'm grateful for a nice conversation. I'm grateful for a bit of sunshine, for a nice cup of tea, uh, for these little things that actually make you look back at the day in a positive way. Whenever It's very useful when you think that you've had a rubbish day or you're, you're a bit in a in a moody uh, <laughs> behavior in the evening, then look back and uh, try to focus on, the, on those positive things. Because we all have that negative bias in our brain uh, that whenever there are nine positive things that happen during the day and one negative, we're likely to just focus on that negative thing, um, even if it's a very little one. So it's important to shift that around and to try to focus on the, on the positive one. The eighth day of well-being, which is probably one of the most important, they're all important, but that one is uh, really close to my heart, is rest, uh, sleep. Um, we all need to fill up our cup. We all need to rest. Uh, try to remember that uh, we cannot pour from an empty cup. So we need to make sure that we have that energy uh, back and by I say rest and not sleep because I know that it might be challenging for people to sleep at night at night some people have insomnia they find it challenging and the more you think about it the harder it gets to actually fall asleep um, so I like to explore in my work and um, life in general I like to explore the gray zones so it's not about not sleeping at all or sleeping eight hours at night. Maybe uh, you sleep four hours at night, but you feel uh, really tired constantly throughout the day. Well, you might have two 20 minutes nap, maybe one around 11 a.m. and one around 3 p.m. or whatever 
you feel that you have that uh, like a drop in productivity or drop in energy so maybe you're in one of those gray zones of not the all or nothing way it's not about um it's not about that so really try to think about rest in, in a more broader uh broader way and if it's not sleeping maybe it might just be taking more breaks actually and just resting and doing nothing for a little while the, the and the ninth uh way of well-being um is uh, it's the most important one the most important of all is don't forget to live take it easy and don't put too much pressure on yourself it's already hard enough uh, we have pressure coming from everywhere so we don't want to be the ones who put that extra uh, pressure we don't really need it it's not good for for stress uh, overall so pick up your uh, your battles choose the ways of well-being that work for you and try to do them constant consistently personally i found january quite hard that lockdown that that we're just hopefully towards the end coming to an end hopefully i found january very hard just because the days were short i was a new mom I, so everything combined plus we couldn't have the extra support that we would have because of the lockdown and i found out that whenever i was not going outside um at five o'clock i was not in a good mood so i knew that i had every day i had to go for a walk and talk to a friend so that was my my two goals of the day were that and not not much more really but I, I knew that as soon as I was doing these two um, I was okay for uh, the rest of the day and then for the following day etc so try to find out the easy things that work for you and don't try to do all the the eight or nine way of well-being but pick up the ones that that work for you what a wonderful toolkit of healthy mechanisms. Lucille's message is so important. Do what makes you smile. It doesn't have to be huge or expensive or social media worthy. It just has to be right for you. I love these nine mechanisms and I personally think they're just as important as any prescription that I write. Connect, disconnect, breathe, get active, Give, learn, take notice and give gratitude. Rest and sleep. And finally, just live. Lucille finishes off by giving advice to her 20 year old self. Now looking back, I would uh, tell my 20 uh, something year old self, um, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> it's gonna be okay. I think there's a lot of in that um, early career stage. There's a lot of um, stress around what is my life going to be. There's so much uncertainty, um, but everything falls back into place, and you discover that as you go uh, in life. So. That's probably what I would uh, tell myself. It's going to be fine and things are going to fall back into, the, into place. Thank you so much for joining us. We are incredibly grateful to Lucille for giving us such helpful, actionable tips for dealing with stress. You can find all the links to Lucille and her organisation MindIt in the show notes. If you want to join the Fresh Heart community, you can subscribe to our newsletter via the website freshheartproject.com. If you liked this episode, we would be so grateful if you could comment, subscribe, and give it a five-star rating, as this helps us to spread our positive health messages. The advice in this episode is not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Remember, be kind to yourself, and small, sustainable steps create great change. This podcast is produced by Lion Mountain Entertainment, a subsidiary of Morgan Archway Limited.